When do people join online? Exactly at 2 p.m. we'll open it up. 2 p.m., okay. <laughs> I see 10 participants. Okay. Yeah, we just have, uh, yeah, the ones that you see right now are, are the pan, are panelists actually. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, if you click on that tab, you'll see attendees on the right. There's another tab. So the moment we open up the webinar, you start. Ah, okay, the got it. Yeah. Going up. Yeah. yeah. Okay, just a quick, quick question then before I start. Uh, yeah. I, I, I cannot stay the, the whole speech, is it? The, the, the whole. Uh, uh, webinar is it is it okay how, how do I do I disconnect at some stage uh, yeah I think it's fine uh, maybe after your speech uh, you could will miss Van stay back or I, I will stay I will stay some but I, I will have to I will have to go a bit a bit uh, like in uh, about one hour ah yeah sure I think it's fine Mark um, okay, once yeah it's fine no problem thank you again. yeah thank you I think Ken, because we are at uh, one more minute. Yeah, go ahead. So we we are just going to open up the session now. Participants increase thirty one. Increasing. Sorry? It's increasing. Yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, you'll probably just wait a couple of seconds, a few, maybe a minute or so to have everyone come in. <clears throat> Make sure you're mute. Mute. No, not me. I need to. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. 
uh, and welcome to InfoFish webinar series exclusively sponsored by Scratting. Um, today, we'll be discussing in length about uh, Mary culture and the future of Asian aquaculture. Uh, as many of you may be aware, amidst this period of restriction movement lockdown since early this year, InfoFish has been organizing a series of webinars uh, specifically since April 2020 and uh, to address relevant issues and to keep the industry stakeholders updated and to continue uh, moving towards sustainable aquaculture production. Uh, according to uh, the recent FAO SOFIA 2019 report, uh, Asia contributes close to 89% of global aquaculture production, whereas uh, the contribution of Asian mariculture in the total marine and coastal aquaculture is about 82%. Uh, this in itself tells you how um, significant and important uh, the uh, region is, uh, particularly uh, now that we're discussing mariculture. So, there's uh, much of development that has been taking place uh, amidst this uh, COVID uh, situation and also specifically in the arena of mariculture. And we hope that today we'll be uh, talking in length and also uh, learning more about what those developments are and have been. So we have a diverse panelist, a group of team of panelists today who have experience in this area. And we'll be discussing the present status, the prospects of mariculture, integration, importance of formulated feed, um, and the role of uh, artificial intelligence, the IoT technology, um, environmental risk management uh, for sustainability in, uh, of Asian aquaculture. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you uh, uh, the, the, the team of panelists today, Mr. Sean Lan. Uh, who is a marine aquaculture specialist with the Soybean Export Council. Uh, Mr. Sean uh, Lan is areas of expertise includes ocean cage farming, fish nutrition, fish formulation, and marine fish disease diagnosis. Uh, Mr. Sean Lan uh, obtained his master's degree from Auburn University, U USA, and has a bachelor's degree from the National Ping Tong University of Science and Technology, Taiwan. Uh, he also accomplished an Aquamed certification from uh, the Louisiana State University, USA. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Tiparat Fontana Panish, who is an aquaculture officer overseeing FAO a Regional Office for Asia and Pacific in Bangkok. Uh, prior to joining FAO, uh, Dr. Tiparat served as an assistant professor at the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics under the Kasetat University in, in Thailand. And she moved from FAO headquarters to uh, the regional office in Bangkok in late 2019. Her area of work covers a wide range of topics in aquaculture and antimicrobial resistance, uh, including shrimp traceability, um, strengthening farmers' entrepreneurship and value chain development, uh, as well as aquaculture insurance. So we're also happy to introduce Dr. Fusi Go, who is the Business Development Director of Corby in the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Fusi Go holds a, a PhD from the National, from the University of Guelph, Canada, and has a master's degree in from the National University of Singapore, uh, and a bachelor's degree from the Ocean University of China. Uh, Dr. Go has been working in the field of aquaculture and nutrition for more than 25 years, and uh, with leading global multinationals uh, such as DSM, Altec, Novapis, Bayer, and Roche. At Corbion, Dr. Fusi is responsible for developing new businesses of Elder Prime DHA for marine fish and shrimp. And he also coordinates the research initiatives and projects, uh, formulating market entry strategies, including product solutions, channels, and uh, competitor analysis for Corbion. Um, and we're also happy to introduce Ms. Joyce Liu, who is uh, with um, Singapore-based Japanese aquaculture startup company, Umitron. Uh, Ms. Joyce uh, studied the marine science from the University of Tasmania, Australia, and prior to returning to Singapore, 
She played a number of roles ranging from animal presentation to conservation, education, and outreach. So very, very impressive uh, panelists we have with extensive experience in this area of mariculture. Um, my name is Shaleen Maria Anthony Sami. I'm uh, representing InfoFish. I work as the director at the organization and I'm happy to be part of this or uh, be introducing to you this uh, elite team of panelists. So before we begin the um, webinar proper, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Mark LaPaul, who is the general manager of Scratting South Asia, uh, who will uh, deliver uh, an opening address for the panel, uh, for, the, for the session. Mr. Mark LaPaul, over to you. Thank you, Shannon. All right. So good, good afternoon to all the attendees in, in Asia. Good morning, eventually, if you are in Europe at the moment, or, and good night for, for, for others. So my name is Marc Lepoul, so responsible indeed for uh, the activities of scratching uh, in Asia. I've been, uh, I've been in Asia for the last 20 years, and I'm uh, talking today from uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. So we are very, at scratching, uh, we are very, very proud to, to partner with this uh, initiative today. Huh? So uh, as, a, as a global aquafield manufacturer, we believe a lot about, uh, about the potential of Asia, you know, obviously in, uh, in, in mariculture and marine fish farming development. And, and I will just take a quick opportunity to, to let you know a bit more about ourselves, about what, uh, what we do at Scratching in Asia and who we are. So Skating is a, it's a global company, a global aquafeed uh, manufacturer uh, with uh, more than 2 million tons of uh, aquafeed manufacture per year and a presence uh, globally. Uh, and, uh, and we are in Asia for quite some time, having, uh, having some operation in the south of uh, Japan, in the south of China, in Vietnam, uh, in India as well, in Gujarat. And we are as well uh, present in, uh, in Tasmania. Uh, so. So those are the, 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 the operations that I would say the, the closest to, uh, to our topic today. And uh, what, we, what we call as our mission, as a, as a feed company, is to be feeding the future, basically uh, uh, tackling all the challenge of, of, uh, of being able to feed in a responsible way uh, the, the, the worldwide population, which is growing fast. Scratching is uh, organized around four pillars, uh, four pillars that are very important and part of our identity, uh, research and development. Uh, we are probably the, the company that has been uh, investing uh, most in, uh, in uh, aquaculture nutrition over the past uh, 40 years. Uh, feed to food quality, uh, something which is very, very important to us as well. Sustainability commitments. And we try to, to help uh, operation by developing uh, uh, new services uh, adapted to, to the new challenges of, uh, of farming in general. So when it comes to, uh, to R&D, uh, we have a company called ARC, which stands for Aquaculture Research Center, which has been uh, working around uh, uh, fish and shrimp nutrition for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, main settlement is in Norway, but we have as well operation uh, in all the parts of the world, uh, more than 100 employees from many nationalities, a lot of uh, Asian uh, colleagues, actually, more and more Asian colleagues, I would say. Um, 40 researchers at the moment, more than 20 PhDs, a lot of collaboration all around the world. And we have uh, not nine on this slide, but actually 10 key species we are working on uh, very, very specifically. The last one being uh, Baramundi, uh, which is a, a new. Uh, a new species of strong interest for, for skating and for, and for the topic probably today as well. So this is a bit of a, of a, of a, of a map where you can, we can see as well our operation in terms of, uh, of research. Huh? So, so we have activities in Japan, working around tuna and yellowtail uh, nutrition. We have operation in, uh, in the south of China, as I, as I said earlier. Uh, some probably new investment to come in Singapore as well. So, 
So you see, we have a, we are not only a, a Norwegian a salmonid company, but very much a worldwide a global player looking at adding value on any kind of uh, fish and shrimp species around. So yes, feeding more than 60 species already when we did. We're very proud about this, uh, this uh, specific uh, know-how of the company. Uh, we work on all stages uh, of aquaculture, uh, from broodstock uh, diets to obviously grower feed, transfer diets for salmonid especially, uh, juveniles and hatchery feed, we work around a lot of uh, different certification. Uh, requirements can be very, very specific from one country to the other one. Uh, we work around the health as well, which is a very important uh, topic for, for us and for, for, the, for the industry in general. A supportive diet, but as well medicated feed in the country where it is allowed, of course. Uh, in terms of development, we're very proud about having a pioneer in uh, reducing the, the usage of, uh, of fish meal in carnivorous uh, diets. Uh, taking here the example of salmon, uh, which uh, we used almost 25, 30% fish meal uh, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, no, 15 years ago, sorry. And now we are able to manufacture uh, uh, salmon feed without the usage of any fish meal and either uh, fish uh, oil. As I said, I'm based in Vietnam, uh, so which is uh, our main platform in Southeast Asia today. We have, uh, we have an operation in, in the south of Vietnam where we manufacture a complete diet for barramundi, grouper, uh, red snapper, cobia, pompano, and, and other species. Uh, as I said, we, we work around health and we have those, uh, those specifically uh, enhancing uh, health diets, functional feed as we, we like to call it working around the different, different problems, health problems uh, you can find in, in shrimp, in marine fish, salmon, in tilapia as well. As I said a bit earlier, feed to food quality uh, and uh, is very important for us as well. Uh, so so we, we pay a lot of attention to ingredient uh, procurement. Uh, we are having a very strong uh, uh, collaboration with our suppliers. Uh, monitoring is very important as well in terms of quality insurance, quality control, and we do trace. Huh? Tra traceability and tracking is, uh, is, is key, is a key uh, inside our operations. Sustainability engagement. Uh, we are a North European uh, company having very, very strong uh, engagement towards sustainability. It's, uh, it's something that uh, that we are very proud about and we have been working at every level of, uh, of our supply chain from procurement, from uh, the impact of our operation, making sure that we, uh, we add value and we, uh, we align with, uh, with those uh, sustainable development goals by, uh, by UN. I said earlier, uh, farming is, is coming to, to more and more uh, technology. And we, we try, of course, to, to make sure that uh, end users, farmers are coping with those uh, technology uh, uh, challenges and, uh, and uh, get the best of the solution we can provide. So we are working around precision farming tools on different species, uh, all starting by uh, having a a very strict uh, growth model of, uh, of, the, of the species. Yeah? So we have a specific growth model on salmonid, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, vanamei shrimp, on tilapia, on barramundi, on cod, which are the, the base on the, on the precision farming tools that we can develop uh, beside. Yeah. Just an example here of, a, of, a, of an activity we are, we are proposing in, uh, in Ecuador, especially. Uh, supporting uh, shrimp farming thanks to the usage of, uh, of those uh, smart uh, aquasim tools. Right. So that was just a, a very quick uh, introduction of uh, who we are as a scratching. And uh, once again, uh, we wish everyone to, have, uh, to enjoy this uh, webinar this afternoon and uh, very proud to be the, the sponsor of this event. So all the best to the, to the speaker uh, after me and uh, looking forward to to learn a lot today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mark Lafall, uh, for that uh, 
opening presentation and also for that uh, brief but comprehensive insight on scratching and its activities uh, uh, towards marine fish farming. Um, so just before I hand over to our moderator, uh, Mr. Sujit Das, I just like to um, uh, inform panel, uh, audience and the panelists that we have today uh, four presentations uh, and uh, we will be taking some question and answers towards the end of the session. So uh, you're invited to submit your, your questions or any um, comments through the Q&A tab that you see at the bottom of the screen. Uh, kindly just submit them through them, uh, through that channel, and uh, we will uh, attempt to uh, perhaps take some questions live, and some of the questions could be also uh, addressed by the individual panelists as well. So without further ado, I'm handing over to uh, Mr. Sujit Das, the moderator for this event. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Yilin. And hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the uh, InfoFish webinar who have just uh, logged in from the different time zones. Uh, my name is Sujit Das, and I'm working as a technical officer at InfoFish, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Let me tell you about the objectives of the webinar, and uh, the invited panelists will discuss about the present status and the prospects of the mariculture and the importance of uh, integration of mariculture, and also the uh, role of uh, innovative uh, technologies like IoT or AI in the uh, future mariculture. And uh, it, thus, uh, we will we'll, we'll know about how to develop the sustainable mariculture in Asia. So as you know, the global population is, uh, will be around uh, 9.7 billion by 2050. Uh, and Asia, Asian population uh, will also be around 5.26 billion, which will be the more than half of the uh, global population. So there, but there is a less uh, land per person in our region, uh, according to the UNEP report uh, 20, uh, 2000, 2000 uh, which is as the point, point 0.1 hectare, and, uh, and which is very, uh, less than the global average, which is uh, 0.2 hectare, 0.24 uh, hectare per person. But uh, we we have we are very hopeful that, and we are very blessed that the water resources in uh, Asia is uh, is used. So we are, we can we can be hopeful about the future of uh, Asian uh, mariculture. But the farmers uh, need to continue uh, supplying. Uh, sustainable animal protein for this uh, increased number of uh, population. So we do believe that integrated mariculture uh, will not only be able to produce the uh, sustainable, uh, substantial amount of food from the sea, but also will play an important role uh, in the employment generation and economic development and the overall sustainability of the coastal communities and uh, continue uh, contributing global food production system. So uh, now I will not talk uh, more today. Uh, our uh, diverse panelists will going to uh, uh, deliver their uh, Belut speech here. I would like to uh, uh, invite Mr. Sean Land, who is a marine uh, aquaculture specialist, and his area of expertise is ocean case farming and the diagnostics of uh, marine fin fishes. Uh, so. It's my pleasure to invite uh, Mr. Sean Len. So the floor is yours, Mr. Sean Len. All right, thank you, Suji. So I go ahead and share my screen, right? Yes. So welcome to the webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, and also good evening for the people who are based in America. <laughs> that today that I wanna just uh, present you the uh, status of the uh, Asia marine uh, aquaculture and also the future development. Um, 
I believe that many of you actually look at this before the uh, FAO publication. The total uh, capture fishery and aquaculture, the development chart that, that actually marine aquaculture is not the biggest one, unfortunately. But if you look at the slope, it does grow the fattest one that among all that. Uh, so we are actually in the very, very fast growth industry. Look at the number here that actually is starting jumping up that from to about uh, since about like 2010 actually is starting jumping until recent year and look at that uh, number starting kind of the slow down again that I think more or less that we hit the point that the coastal water or the uh, environment that actually hit the point that we need to make some change so that we can keep growing. Asia marine aquaculture that actually compared to the other area using the map from FAO that published in 2015, they realized that we actually are in the center of the uh, marine aquaculture. It compared to the other region and also look at that, the, the consumption and realize that actually a lot of those fish we produce is being consumed in the same area. That our area here, many country, many country is more than 30 kilogram per year of the per capita of the seafood consumption and compared to the other area that we actually in a fairly high range in among this region so we produce a lot and then we also consume a lot here at the same region how they gonna shape our agriculture so there are several features actually i the uh, just listed here we are located at the consumers, consuming center. The consumption here, basically, we have the biggest one market. That's everybody just look at it. China is the one. The second features of our aquaculture here is that intensive. It's not enough space on the land. It's also not enough space on the sea. So later on that i'm going to show you several satellite image that to let you realize that how dense our agriculture can be in this area and the third one is the climate range actually from the cold water to the tropical water is a huge range that so go to the north china may have the very uh, a lot of the cold water species and then come to the uh, maybe come to the indonesia that actually a lot of the coral reef and then also a lot of the tropical fish you can find. We also have a huge diversity. I always joking around that the uh, fish species, how many species you culture in this area? My answer is always X plus one ING because that is always increasing. And how many is actually very, very hard to tell. But I give you a rule of thumb that in China, the fish market, every three years that you may find a new species in the fish market and every five years that you may able to find that new species that could can be continue stay in that fish market some of the new species just pop up and then become very popular in a few years after and then suddenly go away the people looking for some new fish to eat in our area, the operation scale is also very diverse. We have the individual farmer that run by the family and also have the integrated from A to Z. All kinds of the uh, aquaculture sector have integrated into one company operation. Market style is also from the live fish to frozen product that you can find. Okay, so people sometimes ask me that, so what is the production? Here's the species that we commonly can find that in the uh, in the, the marine culture, the uh, in the cage. Oh. And the picture here is just the one that we commonly can see is even more that I haven't had a chance to list it. But in general, totally, how many fish right now the marine fish produce in China is roughly about two million tons per year. Southeast Asia is roughly about 1.2 million metric tons per year when all the Southeast Asia country act together. And also I include the milk fish into the uh, marine fish production because this 
although there's a lot of production in the fresh water, but they do have a lot of the milkfish is culture in the, in the sea cage, right? This a list of several countries that here that have the estimation of the uh, fish, uh, breakwater fish production. So we just took for you a re quick reference and look at that, how the people predict that and thinking about uh, the uh, idea about the volume of the production in uh, the uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Philippines, all right? Here is what I try to deliver the message here. We actually in the center of the market, but we actually, a lot of the market is by selling the live fish of the ice chill. And that actually in China have a better uh, economy development, it upgrade the market style. But you look at that, it's still selling live fish. The picture here is from Alibaba, the Herma Fresh is there, uh, the uh, supermarket chain is specifically for the seafood. And Seven Fresh is the one that from Jingdong is a B2C online retailer. But again, that look at all that, and we realize that actually a lot of the, the seafood products still sell that in life. Until recent, recently, the frozen seafood actually is on the market a lot. And the COVID-19 does changing the consumer behavior a lot now. It shifted right now to the frozen seafood more than the live, the live fish. So this is gonna be one of the attention need to look at it because shift to the frozen seafood does help the marine aquaculture development toward to the offshore cage large scale production. The marine cage culture in Asia, well, the picture Oh, Peter, on your left, that, that is the a very traditional cage wrap. On your right will be the polar circle cage. That actually, the polar circle cage is emerging in this area, but it's still developing. The traditional cage front that is fairly small, small scale, but it culture many, many species. It may be that is the only flexibility that you can support to the different demand only. But the rest of that probably is not a, the rest of that is not really an advantage. It also, most of that is run by the family. It's very small. So it tried to develop it, try to expand, it's become quite difficult. And then most of those cage farm is for the local live fish market. If you're talking about the fighter coming here and then say my processing plan, need about 20 tons of fish. This is not the place that you're really going to see, right? And uh, I, in my opinion that it probably won't go away that soon. However, it can be a light car to be the hub for the live fish to support to the uh, sale to the like a local restaurant. Oh, that can be a very handy uh, the uh, facilities that managing. Open ocean cage fund, the polar circle cage fund. This is what I took in Vietnam. Asia, I have to say that is still under developing and still developing, and we are still in the learning stage. The local investment and the foreign investment actually comes out with a very, very different scale and also the technology. Usually the foreign investment from the Western country we don't need to worry too much about that. However, when I go to a lot of the local cage farm that, oh, a lot of the technology critical point have been cut corner. More insistent, whatever you can find that almost every critical point is the problem. And also in Asia, it doesn't have that much supportive industry. Or not like the in Turkey, they even have the company who are only doing the net changing net and maintain your net for you. Here, pretty much that you run the offshore cage farm, you need to do everything by yourself. Here is one thing is very critical that we say that offshore cage in Asia is that is the game with the traditional cage operation mindset because we sometimes see that a lot of the polar circle cage, but the setup is still 
similar to the traditional form. Because we usually see a lot the overloaded cage aquaculture in the bay, and then we don't have enough knowledge to the offshore site and where to be the uh, good place for aquaculture. And sometimes even I see that they put the fish in the offshore cage that but he's still feeding the trash fish. It's actually a big problem because the scale is getting bigger now. So look at that, the, and the other issue that can be from the hatchery, from the feeding and the sustainability. So all that, I won't be able to dress in detail, but I show you some picture of what we find that in the industry. This, I believe that many of you that if you attend the, our seminar before that you see I using this Google image, satellite image at 2009, that I take a shot from the uh, North Fujian province to know that it's very, very dense of the traditional cage together. Um, I was quite frustrated, but I also have the chance to tell the local governments so many years after that this is the picture at 2020 now. It does change that actually have the, uh, still have the uh, traditional cage farm, but the density is not that high anymore. Besides that, we do see the seafood, the seaweed left along the traditional cage farm. That is a good sign, although it's not perfect yet. However, when I see this, I know that at least people who are using the sea is improving by changing the practice so that the environment can be recovered a little bit. Other thing is that the try to set up the offshore cage farm actually is not that easy and simple. It's more complicated, require the authority need to do the zoning licensing and also knowing the carrying capacity of the sea also, after we put the cage to the water, how much impact to the local environment? All that is more like a, when you try to do one production, a lot of the little things around it will need to also implement at the same time. It's not just like a put a cage and then ready to go. The ocean cage, offshore cage consideration that usually when I put the cage, in the sea, how big the water, how fast the water current, how high the way, that some other consideration. And also the other operation is the labor. Do I have the people here know how to operate that? Do you have equipment, devices, supply? And the last one is the economical consideration. And that's most of the time when I travel in South Asia, I found the problem, the biggest one. The funny thing is that the good water, the very good water with all the technically correct factors area have perfect. However, it's just too far away from anything else. It's too far away from anything else, making a difficulty to shipping the feed to the place and also shipping the fish to the other place. Uh, so those is not only in the water need to be good, but also the infrastructure also be able to follow up to catch the opportunity to develop. This is just one of the picture uh, in Southeast Asia. You will see a lot of the kind of the circle cut. That, that actually is the circle cage. It's like this kind of the density. So that's why that I usually come here and then look at that. Is that it's using the polar circle cage, but it's with the traditional cage uh, mindset operation. So well, need to be some change in the future. Trash fish is the problem that we usually see a lot that still the farmer using this for very high value, very high value fish and causing this disease. However, many technology right now actually are affordable in comparison to the technology years ago. The picture of what you see here is microchips into the brooder fish. Well, this is the microchip here. And then I also take a thin plate to do the DNA analysis. And it's the, this is the recirculation system to keep those brooder in these facilities. That by doing that, I am able to identify 
the family is uh, establishing genetic tree for the breeding reference. So actually those molecular technology years ago, you can spend you a lot of money, but now it's not. It actually cost you several thousand dollars. However, immediately you will know that how to implement your breeding program with the scientific rule. And now those things actually should everybody put into the consideration because it's affordable now. It's not that expensive, the say of our technology in the past. And here is the other thing that like an indoor environment controllable facilities right now is getting more and more. But I have more concern is that the people handling the fish is still using the traditional way, the bucket and the net actually does damage to the fish. Uh, so this is like, uh, this is very actually is from Greece. And then we went to the uh, hatchery. They are moving the fish by using the fish. All the fish stay in the water from the, from the tank to the truck without all of the water at all. So those kind of things, I think that in Asia is that we know what people is doing. Actually, those are affordable and you should do it this way. Security is a big issue. Now, actually, if you know how to deal with COVID-19 to prevent the infection, you should be able to also implement the biosecurity in your fish farm. And this is the vaccine injection agency best. Uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 doesn't have the vaccine at this moment. However, I think that for the fish, many vaccines have been developed and they are actually can be very, very good protection to your fish. The others, it's like a, a housekeeping, a food bath, and also that the uh, disinfect the tools, apparatus that after you uh, you using those that contact to the fish. Those kind of things is also what the Asia aquaculture need to be improved. Feed is one of our biggest costs in the aquaculture production. Most of the marine fish are carnivorous species. So, well, in the past that almost all the marine fish feed have a very, very high fish meal inside. Nowadays that it still have fairly high fish meal inside. However, the thing is a change. Technology right now that afforded actually other alternative protein or the advanced plant protein for the option. But the more important thing is that using sustainable ingredients is also a very, very big issue. Right now, a lot of the internet, international certification is certifies the seafood to be if that is sustainable or not, or even we need to uh, certify that if the feed ingredients is sustainable or not. I believe that many of you see the IFO before, and then that actually is very difficult to certify the, the uh, fish meal. But nowadays that actually even the plant protein, we also have the program to certify that if the plant protein is sustainable or not. Like the US soybean that actually have developed the technology and grow those soybean in a better way so reduce the energy and also reduce the soil erosion and also reduce the irrigation. So all that actually right now is developed a lot and those is the feed, feed meal need to pay attention to. Uh, so look at that, the, uh, the, uh, all the uh, certification right now, actually they are very, very uh, detailed, even pinned down to the feed ingredients. And even the plant protein right now has to be very, very precisely certified that to know that oh, this is sort of the, the sustainable ingredients. Of course, that I believe that all of you see those, the uh, certifications. But the very, very good one is that it promotes a sustainable aquaculture and seafood that translates to the best aquaculture practice. And it always, it always makes the aquaculture trigger improve in some way. So is the, uh, what is the challenge and the opportunity for the future? 
my opinion, offshore cage and traditional cage is probably will still coexist, and then traditional cage will be starting decline. Offshore cage will starting take off, but the traditional cage it probably will still become the life the life card hub for the fish transfer to the local live fish market or the restaurant. Oh, but in the future, that frozen seafood gonna be the very, very big jump to promote the offshore cage development. And the other thing is that new technology, especially for the feed and the feeding. But here I list the feeding example, like uh, using the acoustic system for the shrimp feeding and using the uh, using the image recognition system for the fish feeding. So right now, actually, a lot of those is not only by the human judgment to know that should I feed more or not. Right now, actually, a lot of the, the uh, new technology can help human to decide that if the, the animal should be get more food or not. And that actually will be dramatically reduce the FCR. Oh, but the, at this moment, most of the feeding is still done by the uh, human, the people observation. Certification will be the entry basic requirement for establishing the aquaculture re, the operation in the future. Right now, I know a lot of the integrated aquaculture operation take the certification as the value add to be able to go into the major logistic channel. However, I believe that that one day will become, you want to run the aquaculture, this is what you need to do at least. The rest of two will be the COVID-19. One is changing the consumer behavior. Frozen seafood right now in China is hot. And you promote frozen seafood, it does promote the offshore cage aquaculture because the big scale, big volume production when the fish harvest that they need to go to processing become frozen seafood and the frozen seafood can last for the longer time. Live fish can only be the local market and the seafood restaurant locally. And the others that what the COVID-19 change in the aquaculture practice modulize the operation. I have seen a lot of the farm in China they're starting forming like a few people as a group and they actually not able to contact with the other team. It's just like a few group that working alternatively to prevent the infection to each other. So that actually will be the future or at least to react to the COVID-19 situation is the practice in this way. So that is what I find the, uh, my opinion of the challenge and opportunity for the future. And thank you very much for your attention and also thank you for the info fish. Suji, back to thank info fish KL Center. Okay, thank back to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sean Lan. Your uh, it was a very insightful presentation. I hope all the participants uh, enjoyed a lot. And uh, before moving to the next panelist, I would like to remind you all, all the participants, that you can ask your questions and share your comments, views through question and answer option of the uh, Zoom platform. And uh, for easier interaction, please mention the speaker's name to whom you want to interact. And we will come back to you uh, during the question and answer session. Uh, it, it will also be appreciated if you could answer the uh, all questions uh, for your valuable feedback. So uh, this is uh, the time to move uh, to our next panelist. Dr. Tipara, uh, as mentioned by our uh, uh, director, uh, Dr. Tipara, uh, uh, she works with the FAO Regional Office for the Asia and Pacific, and her work area covers wide range of uh, topics in aquaculture, including the antimicrobial resistance, stream traceability, farmers entrepreneurship, value chain development, and aquaculture insurance. So uh, she is going to discuss uh, today uh, on the integrated mariculture, the future of uh, Asian aquaculture. So the floor is yours, Ms. Uh, Dr. Tipara. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, my presentation today is uh, about the integrated uh, marine culture 
as we we'll focus on the type and method uh, by providing some example from Asian countries. Uh, the definition and scope of the integrated marine culture in my presentation will cover uh, main three main types um, uh, of Mali culture in offshore, near shore, and land-based brackish water. Uh, this include uh, IMTA, co-culture or periculture, and special form of integration. Uh, the first one is about IMTA, Integrated um, Multitrophic Aquaculture. Uh, it is a practice in which the byproduct or waste of one species are recycled to become input uh, fertilizer feed or energy for another uh, species. Um, there are three groups of species in this system. One is a fret uh, species, could be finfish or shrimp. And the second group is um, extractive organic uh, species like shellfish. And the third one is um, um, in, in, inorganic extractive species, which is uh, seaweeds. The goal of uh, IMTA is to achieve, mainly is to achieve environmental uh, sustainability to um, bio mitigation. Uh, as in some literature, call IMTA uh, as uh, ecologically engineered aquaculture, or you may call ecological aquaculture. In China, uh, IMTA has been uh, practiced for many decades with uh, many, many species from in close proximity to each other, uh, but we can make it uh, conceptualize it into two main groups. Uh, first is su suspended uh, multi-species aquaculture in shallow waters, and the other one is multi-species large-scale uh, marine ranching in uh, in the sea. Uh, um, um, for the near shore IMTA, we found a case in um, uh, Shang Shango Bay. My maybe not correct uh, reading of this name, Shango Bay. Um, the entire bay is for aquaculture, and then they uh, spare one piece of land for IMTA and monoculture of uh, each species around the IMTA, like uh, fish cake uh, culture, seaweed, uh, oyster, and uh, scallops. Um, Last scale MTA of scallop. Um, Oyster and kerb in Shanko Bay also uh, uh, operated there. Mm. In one of the article, they try to um, conceptualize the models of um, IMT in this bay. They found that there are three main models. Uh, first is a long light culture of abalone and kerb. And the second one, culture of fin fish, bywall and cape. Since uh, this uh, species, like I said, there are three main groups, they fit in different levels. So they uh, good complement of species. And the third one, more with the ben benthic species like a sea cucumber add to the system. Um, in China, there are also uh, different type of marine lynching. Usually when we talk about marine lynching, it's about the practice to enhance the natural stock. But the one that practice in China uh, waters is uh, aquaculture base uh, that benefit on the natural subset that ben benefit also not only uh, good for the environment, but also good for uh, product, aquaculture production. So in this case, I am marine lynching applied in China is integrated with uh, 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 different function like uh, aquaculture production, rehabilitation, and also habitat-based marine lynching with the uh, artificial leaf. Uh, we also found multi-species large-scale sea ranching in uh, Chiang Sidao Island. Uh, this from the re global review of FAO, Billington. Uh, 2009 found that uh, this case is uh, in off offshore allow 10 to 
40 meters water depth, uh, 40 miles offshore of uh, Northern Yellow Sea. They have scallops, sea cucumber, abalone close together, uh, and also add seaweed uh, cultivation and also artificial leaf in the, in the uh, MI, IMTA system in uh, offshore, so-called Mali Lanching. Um, IMTA in Indonesia is in uh, uh, different from what we saw in China. China, it could come from uh, pilot now up to commercialized scale, but in other countries, it's still more on uh, pilot uh, scale. Uh, in Indonesia, they try with uh, IMTA using the call certified double net round cache. Uh, this kind of cache is um, uh, applied in also fresh water and now they move to uh, uh, marine offshore waters. Uh, we found this in, in Jakarta, not, not of Jakarta waters to increase uh, production capacity. There are two layers. Uh, they grow so many species in there. Uh, this is how it looks. There are two sections. First, they try with fresh water. They found that uh, the species grow very well, like with fish, uh, tilapia, and common carp. The production double uh, compared to the conventional cage in the same lake. And also for fish and shrimp, they found that the, 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 two, the two species grow faster than that in a monoculture system. It works like this. There are, uh, the cage has two, two sections. Uh, on the top, the upper section, they grow uh, fed species like uh, shrimp and grouper. And then the lower section is a herbivorous species like a signet fish, uh, stars, and they grow uh, seaweed around the cage. In this case, they try also first with the calerpa, but it didn't work. And then they shade to uh, Ukuma and uh, it, it grow better. In this system, they also uh, collect the physical, chemical, and biological parameters to, and sediment to, to check the water quality. Um, in the Philippines, the concept of integrated aquaculture is uh, not new. Uh, they, can, they apply uh, man, many tribes of species like uh, milfish shrimp, seaweed milfish, shrimp seaweed, uh, rice, uh, tilapia, tilapia crab culture in pond system. But for the open sea, IMTA is uh, quite new. Uh, like I said, it's not that commercialized, but still we found in Cebu, IMTA pilot farm of 0 0.25 hectare using combination of uh, abalone and uh, red seaweed. Um, they choose abalone for the reason that uh, the abalone has a culture has low maintenance cost and a better market price. And then they mix with uh, other species like uh, seaweed. Uh, in, in the pilot uh, area, they divided into three, three stations. Uh, uh, the integration part is the abalone and seaweed. They next to each other. And then they put the control station far away, one kilometer away from the, uh, the integrating system. Um, and then they also measure some parameters. They found out that uh, there's no significant, no, no difference in, in the water parameters compared between the abalone and CV station compared to the control station. Uh, meaning no negative impact was created from the uh, integrated farming. The, the co-culture of uh, Casillalia uh, also apply and uh, it show absorption of absorption capacity of seaweeds uh, to organic nutrient is uh, good, especially for ammonia and nitrate. Mm. They also found that Casillalia can be affected by a filter, but uh, they need to have a larger biomass to maintain uh, uh, the quality of water around the abalone cage. And using a uh, uh, fine mesh nets help prevent labbit fish uh, from crossing the Casillalia. Uh, the culture of Calopa is not suitable for uh, in this case because of the strong wind. That's, uh, 
uh, destroy the seaweed. Uh, another, another group of uh, um, um, maliculture that I would like to present here is also the land-based or co-culture or polyculture and sequential integration. Uh, we have, we found this uh, in extensive review in Max Tour 2009. This is uh, in the publication of a FAO in 2009 uh, called Educated Marine Culture. Uh, and the cases presented in this uh, publication is the, the cases that developed by farmers from their own experience or uh, uh, from research. Indonesia traditional polyculture pawn, um, they mix um, milfish and different uh, um, shrimp species and also uh, fish like mullet and sea bass. Uh, such farming has been sustainable for hundreds of years. Um, polyculture in small scale uh, extensive shrimp farm uh, in Indonesia, uh, they also uh, stock first with the shrimp and after the shrimp reach a certain size and then they release the milk fish in the same pond. Uh, so this system considered that good for both uh, fish for food security and shrimp for export income and income and export earning. Uh, there are also some other polyculture cases in uh, India, uh, Thailand and Vietnam mostly integrated of uh, shrimp or uh, milk or fish with uh, crab and, or, and or seaweed. Uh, in many countries, polyculture and extensive farming, especially with shrimp, were reintroduced after disease outbreak. That means for monoculture and when they have problem, they switch to polyculture, something like that. And recently it also happened in Thailand uh, when uh, shrimp farm applied tilapia in shrimp farming or, or mixed with shrimp farm. Uh, another type is sequential uh, integration. This is uh, the uh, clo uh, recycle, recirculating system in chim, chim farming. In chim farming, in Philippines, uh, polyculture and sequential practice for integrated fin chim farming is mixed with uh, milfish, uh, tilapia, or uh, uh, rabbit fish, or sekanit. Um, the practice involves many uh, systems like low stocking density of shrimp, uh, special pond preparation, increased aeration by establishment of large reservoir that means it needs uh, quite a big uh, area for production, and also stock fish and crop rotation, tilapia with other fish because these uh, species, they have probiotic effect, separate treatment pond, stock with fish, by wall or seaweed. And then uh, in Philippines, they also have uh, fish stock in net enclosure, put in the center of the pond where they, uh, when they turn on the aerator and then the waste will be at the center of the pond. This is what happened in Philippines. Uh, the last group is uh, the specialized form of integration that uh, include in my presentation here. It could also cover live fried fish of rice stream in temporal integration or rotation system. Uh, it's quite complex and demand appropriate uh, fuel and land preparation for good water management. Uh, the practice uh, apply in far in Bangladesh and Vietnam. Um, the trend has been abandoned to rice uh, component in favor of uh, uh, shrimp farming, uh, which may increase the uh, farmer's vulnerability and decrease uh, uh, production of uh, main staple uh, crop like uh, rice. So in Vietnam and Bangladesh, they have some regulation to limit the, the, the trend, the, the changes. And, and the last one is uh, so-called aqua silviculture. Uh, we found mix of aquaculture with mangrove. It could be mixed like type one, grow mangrove and put some fish or shrimp there or separate zone next to each other. The, uh, we found in China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia. So the question now, is it the future for Asia aquaculture? 
uh, our example just said uh, uh, in last state actual and potential benefit, uh, which in fact are goals of sustainable aquaculture, uh, namely uh, product diversification. We can see, you can see that there's so many uh, species that can put in one system. Um, environmental sustainability, like marine lynching, that also puts some artificial leaf or uh, seaweed. Uh, and, and good for us, uh, livelihood of people, especially our uh, small scale farmers in Asia. When we say small farmers in Asia, it's totally different from what we see in, in the other side of the world. So, the, but the, there are also some challenges to, um, um, Add to uh, our first speaker just mentioned, uh, there's a lot of technical element that we need to consider. Uh, but for the integration, even more that we need to talk about, like uh, um, uh, Max Toll um, used to mention that no universal integrated system exists uh, when we talk about integrated mariculture. Um, choice of technology and species is different from uh, by region and then also socioeconomic uh, condition. Um, there were suggested that uh, um, need to choose the right species, like uh, use local species within the norm normal geographical uh, range and for which technology is available and then uh, the species that can complement each other, uh, especially the IMTA that can fit uh, along the uh, multi-tophic level. Use species that can grow in significant biomass, as especially the species that act as a biofilter and use the species that of course have, uh, you can sell and have market and good price. You can see that uh, the, not only IMT always put one main species with high uh, a good price like a shrimp or a grouper or balloon, something like that. Site-specific integrated practices need to be implemented in wider ecosystem uh, following uh, ecosystem approach. The question is now, when we integrated uh, the system like that, the benefit is uh, not only uh, the fish that we produce, but also good for the environment. That's why how do we uh, uh, include this kind of benefit into the products? That's, that's uh, is something that we need to think. Um, product dif differentiation from this system that need to be de developed uh, in, in some ways. Uh, how do we add the value to this product, how our consumer will, will have their heart for uh, environmental friendly uh, prod products. That is uh, how the way we include the environmental benefit into uh, the product because it's not, it's not uh, turned into the dollar side. So how do we make it into the dollar side? So something to do with the marketing of the product. And this may be developed in a combination with promoting the adoption of good farm practices and responsible aquaculture. And meanwhile, also supported by the stringent environmental regulations, like what happened now and even more uh, in developed country, like in Europe uh, and uh, uh, New Zealand, Australia, country like those, which they have very uh, uh, strict environmental uh, law and regulations. So in Asia, um, this is the hope if we really want to push uh, integrated farming in, in near shore and offshore, including land-based uh, mariculture. I think that's all from my presentation and you, I will share this PowerPoint with uh, uh, InfoFish and that contain uh, uh, a list of references that may be useful to all of you. Thank you very much. Over. Thank you, Dr. Chiparat, for your comprehensive presentation and your uh, uh, practical examples from Vietnam, Indonesia, even from Bangladesh. And uh, I, I hope uh, our uh, participants enjoyed a lot and learned a lot from your uh, presentation. Uh,
now uh, we will uh, uh, now we are going to uh, moving to our next uh, panelist uh, before uh, going to uh, our next panelist i'll uh, just give you an a brief uh, uh, in some some years back uh, we had some uh, report from fao that 4 million metric ton of uh, trust fees has been used uh, in in our region that is in asia 4 million metric ton of trust fees has been used in our uh, agriculture but uh, though it has some uh, effects on the environment and uh, so uh, the situation though already changed and is now being uh, farmers are now being habituated with the pellet feed and but yet uh, i think uh, feed millers uh, fish marine fish farmers and the nutritionists have to uh, have all togetherly work to uh, improve the situation so uh, we have uh, dr fusi uh, here and he has uh, more than 25 years of experience working with the leading multinational companies like DSM, Alltech, Bayer, and Roche. So he's uh, going to uh, discuss on the marine fin fish feed formulation, key considerations. So the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Fusi. Thank you, Sujit. I'll go ahead to share my screen. Thank you once again to InfoFish um, for organizing this wonderful seminar. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to, to all the participants uh, tuning in all over the world. Um, I'm based out of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I'm really is, is so delighted to be able to have this opportunity to share with uh, the audience. I just look at the participant, we are reaching like 190. So that's wonderful. Um, I was given the topic um, by Sujin to talk about um, marine fin feed uh, formulation, uh, key considerations. Um, currently, I'm with uh, Kobion, a Dutch company, for close to two years right now. I'm developing business for uh, uh, LG ingredient called Algopine DHA. So um, very briefly, um, just spending maybe only uh, one minute to briefly introduce who, uh, what is, who is Kobion? Uh, Kobion, um, we had three division in the company. Um, the, uh, the food division, we call it sustainable food, and the lactic acid division, and the incubator division. Uh, I'm, I'm in the incubator division. Um, overall, the company has about 1 billion euro uh, turnover. We have about 2,000 employees, and we have 13 manufacturing facilities. Um, Basically, the company's goal is to preserving food and food production and protect our health and the planet. Um, we are fully aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, the UN SDA, SDG, uh, in particular, the number two to uh, reduce zero hunger, number three, good health and well being, and number 12, responsible consumption and production. So these are our goals. By 2025, um, we have set our specific uh, sustainable goal. Okay, so back to our topic today, key consideration for marine fin fish formulation. Um, so I'm asking a question. So what is an ideal feed for marine fin fish? An ideal fee should be cost effective. It should be nutritionally balanced. And it should be environmentally friendly and sustainable. It should have high performance. And at last, the end product should be safe and the quality of the fish fresh should be high. Okay, so I'm going to go through each one of them. Cost effective. 
the fee has to be cost effective. Um, got something pop up on my screen. Okay, all right. Everybody hear me okay? Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, we know that <clears throat> 50 to 80% of the production costs are uh, coming from the feed costs. And uh, so um, to reduce feed costs or to manage feed costs, you will manage your production costs. So as uh, Sujin does mention early on, there are 4 million tons of uh, trash fish are used in, in Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, it's very really popular for trash fish, um, but let's look at the nutritional profile of trash fish. Um, say, for instance, uh, anchovy or pony fish, the carbohydrate level of anchovy is less than, less than 1%. The protein level is ranged from 14 to 20%. The big majority in the trash fish is actually water, but the moisture contents are close to 80%. Relative to that, compared to uh, sorry about that, compared to formulated fee, um, just simply pick three um, formulation fee. Look at their nutritional profile. The typical carbohydrate level is from 15 to 20%. Protein level from 22 to up to 50%. And moisture level, well, around 10%. So, why there are 4 million tons of trash fish used? Because people think that the unit cost is low. It's low cost. And formulated feed have relatively higher cost. But trash fish has high FCR, the feed conversion ratio. Um, typically seven to 10 FCR. And for the formulated feed, usually it's around one to two. And for sea bass in this part of the world, 1.5, and some can even go down to 1.2, 1.1. So for trash fish, they are also, uh, it's also variable in quality and quantity because they are seasonal supply. It has a very short shelf life. You need to put it uh, in, uh, in refrigerator to keep it cool. Otherwise, it spoils very easily and they pollute the water. But the most important is they could be a disease factors because the trash fish, is actually not being processed, not being cooked. So the bacteria, the virus, or the parasite will not be killed before they are feed to the fish, they are fed to the fish. On the other hand, formulated feed give you lower FCR. They are consistent in supply. There are so many feed mill around the world in this region to supply to you. And they are easy to store and handle they have very long cell life, uh, typically six months to a year. And because they are well cooked, well processed, there's not a disease factor. So formulated wheat feed is the way to go for to supporting uh, the marine fin fish culture. So talking about cost effectiveness and, 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 and formulated feed um, coming to how feed are processed, yeah? So feed can be produced by, by pressing, called pelleting, or could be by extrusion, yeah? Just have a comparison of that. Looking at um, cost to produce, pelleting machine is relatively cheaper compared to extruder because the, 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 the initial cost for extruder is higher, yeah? For the feed type, Pelleting machine can only produce sinking feed yeah, because it's pressing, it's very dense. But for extruder, uh, folding feed, <coughs> excuse me, semi folding, even sinking feed can be possible. Yeah? In terms of FCR comparison, pelleting machine, um, usually the FCR a little bit higher 
then they exude the heat. Yeah, and starch generalization, uh, gelatinization, pelletin feed is not as good as extruded feed because extruder has higher temperature, and higher pressure. Water stability also extruded feed is better than the than the pelletin feed. In terms of digestibility, also extruded feed is better than the pelletin feed. Yeah. In terms of dust, dust content, um, um, dust is a waste. So um, pellet, pellet feet tend to have more dust than the extruded feet. Yeah? Uh, in terms of water pollution, extruded feet also stand out. Um, coming to spray coating um, oil or enzymes, um, pellet feet will be a little bit harder to coat on because it's very hard. There's no pause for the for the liquid to penetrate into uh, the pellets. Um, and in terms of choice or raw material, um, pelletin, pelletin feed, the choice is wider. Yeah, extruded feed is more strict in terms of raw material selection. Okay, so extruder is the way forward. Yeah. Now we come to the raw material selections. The best to save cost is to source raw material locally because this will reduce transportation costs, also will keep the freshness of the raw material high. In terms of grade of raw material, well, um, you can choose between high grade, mid range or lower digestible ingredients. It all depends on uh, the formulation cost. Yeah. So if you want to pre produce a premium fee or you want to produce a low cost fee. And so many feed mill practicing this cost formulation in order to bring the cost of uh, feed down. Yeah. So um, some farmer doing, they prefer to use the lowest cost per kilo of feed purchase. Um, compared to the lowest cost per kilo of fish produced. So which way to choose? Um, of course, from the feed meal point of view, lowest cost per kilo of fish produced is the way to go. I think that is the best way. Yeah. Um, we should also avoid uh, adulterated materials. And when you buy fish meal, make sure it's 100% fish meal. They are not mixed with feather meal or any kind of low, uh, cheaper protein source. Yeah. There's also a tendency of using pre-digested material, um, that pre-enzyme treated, such as that fermented soybean meal. Um, basically, using enzyme or, or bacteria to cut the big molecule down into peptides or smaller molecules, yeah? or preheated or grinding to a final particle size. Uh, physical grinding actually play an important part because um, uh, you're grinding from 500 microns down to 100 microns. Of course, there's an energy cost, but the digestibility of the 100 microns will certainly be better than the 500 microns. And there are quite a lot of publications around. Um, moving on to cost of reduction of feed, you can um, try to use feed additives, um, such as application of feed enzymes. Um, um, feed enzymes are famous for re um, removing the anti-nutritional factors, such as phytate. Yeah, just using phytase you can cut the plant material phytate into usable uh, material like inositol plus the uh, smaller proteins and release um, those cations. Yeah? Enzyme in use, uh, very common are phytase, um, now getting more popular xylalase and protease is not as popular yet uh, due to cost. And because we say before, feed is produced either pelleting or extruding. And these all involve with very uh, high heat. And the heat enzyme are proteins. So uh, when you are heat involved, 
enzymes tend to be can be denatured. So when enzymes are denatured, uh, it's not working. So uh, when you come to choose enzyme, choose between powder or liquid. So powder, you can add all together with all your raw material. Come into liquid, you have to spray it after pelleting or after extrusion. Um, the next point is to use feed additives. Um, also, some people call it functional ingredients. Um, like vitamins, especially the B groups, they, they can help in digestion and absorption. Um, can you also use acidifier to reduce the pH? Because most of fish, uh, the stomach is not is close to neutral and very different from mammal or land animals that pH are pretty low. Um, so acidifier can improve digestion. Um, you can also use binders, um, pellet binders to reduce dust that we talked about earlier. Toxin binder to reduce the mycotoxin risk. Um, you also use preservatives um, to, to reduce feed storage and wastage. Yeah? The last point is not so much related to uh, feed formulation, is to, to manage your, 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 your feeding. Yeah? You can feed less using AI, which our next speaker will talk about. Um, auto feeders, uh, which are very popular in salmon farming as well as in shrimp farming. And you can also can feed in alternative. Okay, um, I'm spending a little bit more time on the cost effectiveness. Now we move on to nutritionally balanced. Okay, um, different species of fish and different life stages, life stages of fish have a specific functional nutritional needs. And uh, formulated feed contain many ingredients from marine plants or land animal source. So these ingredients provide nutrients like protein and amino acid, fat and fatty acid, vitamin and minerals. So these nutrients need to be balanced for each species of fish. Yeah, I'm putting the chart here, looking at the barrel theory. Yeah, it's just um, taking using amino acid or uh, uh, trace mineral as an example. Yeah, so the, you have to figure out what is the limiting amino acid or what is the limiting nutrients. What is the limiting uh, uh, trace minerals and formulated in a balanced way? Okay, there are over two hundred species of uh, of uh, uh, fish in farm in this part of the world. Um, so we have to focus on the economically important species such such as sea bass, banamundi, groupers, red snapper, red sea bream. And down south, in salmon. So nutritionists and formulators need to have a good understanding of nutritional requirement of the species that uh, that you're going to produce fish for. So, and then you can formulate the feed according uh, according to the species, according to the life stages, according to the cultural method, either intensive or extensive, according to the cultural method of whether it's in pond culture, net pen, or in cage culture. Okay. Move on to the third point. The fee, ideal fee has to be environmentally friendly and sustainable. Um, Sean, our early speaker, has a better picture than mine. So um, environmental friendly. We have to make sure we minimize pollution to the ocean to the river and to the estuaries, yeah? Definitely no antibiotics should be formulated in the aqua feed unless it's permitted to use. You have the veterinarian uh, permit, permission prescribed by, by the vet. Otherwise, antibiotic, antibiotics should be no-no in a fish feed, yeah? Moving on to sustainable ingredients. Talking about fish meal and fish oil. As we know, fish meal coming from forage fish, from our ocean, and here the chart shows that for to produce 24 tons of fish meal, you need about 100 tons of, of, of forage fish, or we call trash fish, and uh, and 100 tons of forage fish can produce about five metric tons of fish oil. And where do these fish meal, fish oil use? 
more than 70% of the fish meal go to aquaculture use. 73% of fish oil go to uh, feeding fish or shrimp. Um, you have seen this chart early on, um, on early speakers. Um, this is from FAO. So just giving you the marine resources um, in our oceans, such as fish. More than 90% of our ocean is fished. Yeah? And more than 60% of is maximally but sustainably fished. However, more than 30% is overfished, which is biologically unsustainable. So we really need replacement for fish meal and fish oil. Yeah. There was an early article, uh, there was an article this year, uh, very recently published by uh, Catherine Hua and the group from uh, James Cook University in Singapore. Very nice graphic. Um, so talking about fish replace, fish meal replacement. Fish meal can be partially or totally replaced, yet uh, the impact on the growth or the performance is very minimum or some of them even have better growth. So the literature is here and they were performed with rainbow trial, European sea bass with very good results. Yeah. So what are the repla replacement candidates for fish meal? Very much talk about insect meal, microalgae, single cell proteins, and quail meals. And we talk about early on fermented soybean meal and also animal byproducts. So we move on to fish oil replacement. Um, and there was a study by uh, uh, early on in 2015 that there, there's a gap between uh, fish oil supply and fish oil demand. We know that 70% of fish oil is used in aquaculture. So the demand and the supply, there's a gap about 400,000 tons in 2015. We forecast that as this year go by um, to 2050, the gap will be more than 600,000 tons. Uh, so we definitely need new source of or omega-3 uh, long chain of omega-3 fatty acids to responsibly go aquaculture. Um, talking about fish oil replacement, uh, we will touch on the fish oil price. And the fish oil price is very volatile in the past 10 years. Um, in 2010, the fish oil price, let's look at the lower glove, lower, lower, lower curve, um, it's about 900 US dollars per ton. It went up in 2018 to almost $3,000. And look at the chart on the right. This is uh, this year during the COVID time. Um, fish oil went up to, uh, the fish oil for aquaculture use, went up to $2,560 a ton. Um, recently it kind of dropped a little bit to 2100 still the price is very, uh, it's about $2,000. So for fish oil replacement, um, there are many ways. Uh, one of the um, sustainable way is using microalgae. Yeah. Um, our company have able to produce in commercial large scales uh, from Cisochytrium, a, a marine microalgae to address the gap of uh, uh, of the supply of fish oil. Okay. Conventional way, microalgae in the ocean is eaten up by, by zooplankton, and zooplankton is eaten up by fish, and then the fishing vessel to harvest the fish, to process the fish, to get the fish oil, and then we spray fish oil onto fish feed to feed into our fish. Now there's a convention, there's a new pathway that we can directly cut all the needle stages from the microalgae through fermentation, vessels directly delivered to the fish. And this can be produced in a matter of days with very consistent omega-3 level. 
in 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 auto prime DHA case, we can constantly deliver twenty eight percent minimum of DHA. Okay, so uh, moving on to our first uh, the fourth point, uh, ideal feed should be given the fish with high performance. Yeah, um, first you have to put, provide fast growth. Um, okay, so um, most of our marine fish are mostly carnivorous fish. And um, of course, uh, the mullet is omnivorous, but it's not so well uh, on the mainstream of culture. Mostly salmon, eel, trout, um, and sea bass, sea bream, and turbot, kingfish. These are all marine fish. Yeah. So I know in, in, in this part of Asia, uh, an oil coater with vacuum, vacuum oil coater, is a big investment. It's, it's a one million US dollar investment, but a good one. So many feed meal do not have a vacuum oil coater. Um, because algal prime is a powder form, so it can be easily added into the, into the raw material which, which everything are all in powder form. And so make it possible to add high level, high percentage of oil without ca causing you know, oil leaching when the feed are de delivered to the customer. Um, we do not have an oil coater. There's only a certain amount of feed that could, uh, oil could be sprayed on. Okay, I borrowed this chart from uh, from a very nice paper from uh, Israeli study. Um, that different sizes and different temperature uh, of of fish that affect their performance, their growth performance. And uh, this is. Was done with Banamundi with the sea bass, looking at the the growth of the fish at 24 to 29 uh, degrees Celsius is better, higher than uh, temperature at 20 to 24 degrees. And this is obvious because uh, fish cannot regulate their body temperature; they go with their their surrounding temperature. So, what's the implication of this? Because we are talking about marine fin fish culture. The fish could be grown in the pond with a water depth of one meter, one and a half meters. The fish could be grown in the net pan or cages with the ocean of as deep as like 40 meters at, according to our early speakers. So the temperature of the seawater, sure, is not the same compared to the pond water. So should the feed be formulated accordingly to provide a different energy level? For even the same species of fish, I think this is a good question for all the nutritionists, all the formulators formulate to think about. Yeah. Okay. Um, high performance. Uh, we talk about lower FCR. Yeah. So this is just a table showing, say, to produce hundred thousand tons of fish with the FCR of one point six. Very typically for sea bass right now. You need 1,000, 16,000 tons of feed. If you can able to reduce the FCR to one, then you only need 10,000 tons of feed. The saving of 6,000 tons of feed is a very good saving for the farmer as well for the environment. Same case for 100,000 tons of production farm. 60% of, 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 of feed cost saving as a huge thing. The goal for all the nutritionists and formulator is to reduce to lower the FCR. All right. Moving on to the last point, we need to provide safe and quality feed for our consumers. Yeah. By reducing contaminants in our feed, in our raw material. Now, the contribution of feed ingredients to the op to POP. That's the persistent organic pollutants, uh, including PCB dioxin. See, these are the chart shows you the contribution. Fish oil contribute the POP more than 54%. Fish meal contribute about 12%. Vegetable protein, vegetable oil contribute another 35%. So fish oil and fish meal currently contributed more than 50% of contaminant in the feed. This is a very big issue. So reducing fish meal, replacing fish oil will help us reducing the contaminant 
in the feet and ultimately in the fish that we provided to the consumer. So I'm coming to the last line, the conclusion. So the formulated feed can be cost effective, but as suitably is the way forward. Formulated feed should be nutritionally balanced, oops, sorry, environmental friendly, and ingredients should be sourced from sustainable way. And formulated feed should give high performance, provided safe and quality fish fresh for the human being. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you and excellent. I think all the uh, participants enjoyed your presentation and it was a very insightful, in-depth presentation. I see how um, is uh, uh, in, in the future, uh, in future, how uh, farmers need the cost-effective feed, a balanced feed in the, to replace the, uh, uh, what we can say, the, to replace the uh, uh, cross fish application in uh, mariculture. So uh, I think uh, uh, we in future we can uh, we, we can talk uh, with Dr. Fusi uh, in details uh, on the uh, uh, nutrition of marine fin fishes. And uh, uh, to remind all the participants, uh, uh, you can please uh, send your questions to to the uh, uh, through the Q and A tab. And uh, you can also uh, we'll appreciate to answer the poll questions. Um, uh, to for your valuable feedback and now we are moving to our uh, next panelist uh, before uh, going to uh, our next panelist i just uh, give a brief uh, idea uh, actually technology gives us the assurance and the validation that we need to continue or change so we should take the advantage of uh, technology in mariculture moreover environmental risk management uh, helps us to manage the possible threats adverse effects and can take the environmental advantages that can increase the productivity. Uh, uh, it is not me. I think Ms. Joyce can uh, dis discuss more on that uh, because she is a uh, marine scientist and uh, she is working for a uh, Singapore-based Japanese aquaculture startup, Omitron. She is going to speak on uh, artificial intelligence and IoT technology to improve the farm efficiency and to reduce the environmental risk. Uh, uh, to which we are uh, looking forward in future. Uh, so it's over to you, Ms. Joyce. Thank you so much, Sujit. Let me firstly share my screen. Right. So good afternoon, everybody, and good morning and good evening. So thank you, everyone, for dialing in today for this webinar, and thank you to InfoFish and Squidding for the opportunity to present today alongside these amazing speakers we've heard from so far. Uh, my name is Joyce and as mentioned, I am a marine scientist working for a startup company called Omitron. We are based in Singapore and in Japan and we are focused on delivering data-driven software solutions for the aquaculture industry. So today I'll be talking a little bit about how we've used AI and IoT technology to help the industry progress forward. While the application of tech um, tends to be better on a, a global scale. Asia is definitely primed for its adoption to increase its productivity over the next few years. But ultimately, our vision is to be able to install sustainable aquaculture on Earth. So our story begins in space. Umitron's founders actually had their start in the aerospace and software engineering industry and they were looking for potential areas where they could leverage their knowledge to solve important issues. And Earth is often called the blue marble for a good reason. 71% of its surface is covered by water. And with advances in satellite technology and data analytics, there was a huge potential for us to make a very big impact. So why did we want to work in aquaculture? And our reply is, why not? As you've heard already from uh, Mr. Sean Lam, our population is currently on a fast track of growth and we're expected to hit, to hit more than what 9.7 billion people by the year 2050. Rising affluence in the middle classes, particularly in Asia, also means that there is an increased demand for better quality of food, particularly for types of protein. We've also observed an increasing adoption of technology around the world 
over the past 20 to 30 years, in part due to its decreasing costs and also increased excess. Coupled with this need to feed our ever-increasing population, the way that we meet our protein demands will also need to adapt to the changing times. So there is so much untapped potential for aquaculture to fill this protein gap, and we've definitely seen it grow in numbers since the 1950s. As we've heard earlier today, it's not the biggest industry, but it's certainly the fastest growing. So much so that the percentage that we eat that is farmed right now is greater than what is already provided via wild caught sources. And this trend is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. Fish is also a highly resource efficient form of protein to farm as compared to its other counterparts such as beef, chicken and pork. And with this potential, we not only want to push for sustainability, but also for the aquaculture industry to grow in a safe, resource efficient, as well as a profitable way. And we want to do this by data. So I suppose the next question would be, who do we want to work with? And the short answer is ideally everyone. However, we needed to be practical and we decided to start by focusing on key target species, regions, as well as stakeholders in areas where we felt we could make the most impact and then we worked our way from there. We've spent a lot of time over the past year or so visiting various farms around the world, talking to farmers and finding out what their key challenges were and how we may be able to come up with ways to help them. And one of the problems that often came up in conversation was actually feed use and feed management. Firstly, as you've heard already, feed can be very expensive and can often account for more than 50% of a farm's total production cost. Secondly, the process of feeding can also be fairly time consuming. And depending on the type of farm, there's so much variation out there right now, it can also be considerably labor intensive as well. We've seen in more recent times, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in significant resource shortages and that's particularly in the provision of manpower. So, and lastly, aquaculture produces waste. And if not managed well, we've heard already, this can negatively affect the ecosystem. Unconsumed feed can result in excess nutrients entering the surrounding waters. And if they're not used up, they can accumulate, they can become pollutants, and this can overload the system in turn creating dead zones due to sedimentation or even trigger potential events such as algal booms. As such, inappropriate feeding and poor management of feeding protocols would not only have a significant impact on a producer's profit margins, but it would also contribute in creating unsavory environmental conditions on the farm that would impact the site in the long term. So this calls for the need to reevaluate the way that we feed fish not just from a feed ingredients or replacement perspective, but also the methodology that we feed fish throughout the production cycle, and we need to adopt best practices. So we feel that technology is the best way to do that. So now that we've realized that uh, helping farms from a feeding perspective was really the best way to go, our team worked on creating what we call the Fish Appetite Index, AKA the FAI. And using machine learning, farmers are able to use the resulting data as a guideline to determine if their fish are hungry or not. And this in turn helps them to manage their feeding operations in a much better way. So let's see what this looks like in action. Here we have actual data taken from one of the red sea bream farms that we're currently working with in Japan. And FAI essentially provides recommendations Based on the traffic light color coding system, green here that you see here indicates the fish are hungry, they're very active. Amber or yellow means the fish are starting to become full and they're beginning to lose interest. And red basically means that the fish are, are no longer hungry, they've stopped having that interest in feeding. Right now, the farmers that we work with are still making decisions actively based on the stop signal recommendations that's provided by FAI. But as with all AI systems, we believe that once there's enough data collected and enough training by machine learning, this process can be 100% automated. So 
Despite branding ourselves as a software-centric company, we realize that not every farm, particularly those in Asia, has the ability to access our software due to the lack of hardware, hardware available. And as such, we've created two IoT devices called Umitron Cell and Umitron Eye. On the left, we have Cell, what we like to call internally a plugless and play smart feeder. The top portion you see there has a 400 kilogram feed silo. The bottom contains a feeding mechanism, an onboard computer and a battery. And on the top lid there, there's also a solar panel and that reduces the need for a farm to have to tap into a power source when this device is installed far out at sea. And on the right, we have Umitron Eye, which basically has all the features Umitron Cell has, except for the feed silo. Based on the feedback that we've gleaned so far, Cell has been better suited for farms that are still doing cage feeding manually and individually, and Eye is better suited for farms that already have some form of uh, centralized feeding systems such as barges installed, but they may not yet have some for any form of camera systems in place for them to monitor the environment and the fish. So here's what Umitron cell looks like in action when installed out at sea. You can see there is a gangway in the middle of the fish cages over there and then that's where we mount the device on. Apart from uh, accessing our software via a web browser, as you've already seen in earlier slides, we've also developed an app because it's not always practical for a farmer to lug their laptop along with them when they go out to the cage. So this allows users to continue doing the feeding protocols by their mobile devices. And in, in, uh, sorry, in addition to the feeding ability um, and the ability to view cages in real time from basically anywhere in the world, you could even do this from your couch at home, the users may also access the app to toggle the feed timing settings based on the behavior, they can check feed weights that's already been dispensed and what's left in the feed silo. And they can also check on previously recorded data to assess their fish performance over time. And here's an example of one, uh, how one farmer that we're working with has changed their feeding protocols after using cell. And this is quite a drastic change actually. So using the same amount of allocated feed, uh, he moved from feeding one time a day to feeding more than 15 times a day based on the fish feeding response, and that's using FAI. This previously would never have been possible unless the farmer was camping at the cage for the entire day. And as such, this also in turn, because we're using FAI to gauge the feeding response and feeding accordingly, that in turn reduces the amount of excess feed that's entering into the water. What we have here is also some sample data from one of the farms, and we've been able to help them by harvesting up to six months early using our tech. So this is a combination of FAI and Umitron cell. Naturally, uh, every farm's result would vary based on their production goals, it would vary based on their production operations and methodology, and this is just one example of how we have helped them to hit those targets. Not too long ago, we've also started working with IDB using Umitron Cell in Peru. Uh, this is a project focused on improving the sustainability of fish farming and also the work-life balance of farmers. We're also looking at how we can better protect the environment while still helping fish production to grow commercially and sustainably. As mentioned so far, making advances in feed optimization by AI and IoT technology has been a big part of what we do and that's what we've been working on so far. But there's also other areas that we've been developing solutions for as well. One project that's still a work in progress seeks to help producers answer the HO question. Exactly how much fish am I farming right now? Short of the ability for us to breathe underwater or have that manpower resource to harvest, uh, to sample fish frequently to check on their size and weight, which actually can create a lot of stress for the fish. It is actually a challenge for farmers to be entirely sure of how much the their fish weigh until that point of harvest. So via underwater cameras and the use of AI tech, we have been able to um, reduce that guesswork essentially and to give a better size estimation of what's in the water at any one point in time. 
And even though we're charting just the length right now, with the application of the right models, we are confident that we can give a very good correlation between length and weight for the species that you're farming. Not only have we been dabbling in the fish space, we've also started dabbling in the shrimp space. We've since partnered with CP Foods on a project that will allow us to integrate our AI-based technology onto their farms. And our goal is to help them develop a model that will pave the way for sustainable and intensive shrimp farming in the future. Moving even more recently, <laughs> we've also come full circle and we've gone back to our roots in space. A few weeks ago, we've launched Umichon Pulse, and this is a web-based service that uses satellite remote sensing data, allowing farmers to actively monitor water quality parameters, such as temperature, dissolved oxygen, and salinity. And we hope this gives farmers an additional tool to, for them to help monitor their marine environment and also to improve their decision-making. And hopefully with this, and in addition to other solutions, technology solutions, this will hopefully help all farms uh, in all aspects of farm management, not just from feeding, disease mitigation, but also risk management as well. So, kept it short and sweet, I hope I've managed to give you a flavor of the potential of AI and IoT technology to help farms with not only improving farm efficiency, but down the road, helping them with risk management, environmental management, and also to lead the way for a more sustainable future for the aquaculture industry. Thank you, that's all for me. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Miss Joyce. I think uh, life under the sea will be very interesting in future. Uh, and we'll have, uh, now we are go going to moving to our next session, the most uh, expected session, the question answer session. Uh, uh, I think uh, our panelist, our Belut panelist already uh, replied some of the questions, uh, but I need to uh, draw attention uh, for some questions. Uh, I would like to go to Mr. Sean Len first. Yes. Yes, sir. So uh, one question to you that uh, which species is most suitable in terms of uh, feed availability, broodstock and marketing? All right. Uh, at least, at least top three species. Yeah. In the in the South Asia and also Asia subcontinents, that is at this moment probably we can consider Asian sea bass, the uh, Baromundi, all right, Pampano, and the other one. The other one I would recommend it's probably more on the niche market and not grouper, cobia. But at this moment, I know Vietnam and Taiwan have a lot of the commercial reproduction, the hatchery available, but it's probably not the other area. But, but again, they have talked a very, very niche market. If you look at FAO, the uh, statistics books that you find the China, have some production, Taiwan has some production, Vietnam has some production, and the other country is Panama. And pretty much that's all. It's not really forming a, it's not really forming a very, very the uh, prevalent market, but it's the target on the niche market. That is probably, but the, but, but the first two, the, the agency best and also the Pampano right now, yeah, just target on the uh, international market. I think you can just get by. It, it's always matter on the price high and low. But in terms of the sale of the fish, it's possible. Yeah, so, so that is my opinion on that. If, if is any new farmer, right? Jump into the, yeah, yeah. so that's probably stay on the safe side until you own very, very clear and concrete uh, the uh, market channel. Otherwise, yeah. before that, have better on just like uh, those common species. Uh, before going to next question, I'll just uh, add uh, one additional question to you. Hmm. Basically, uh, what are the uh, specific requirement uh, for setting up a case uh, in case of mariculture? What are the basic requirements for setting up a case? The cage farm, right? The yeah. polar circle offshore yeah. cage farm. Yeah, yeah. 
they actually comes out with the several components that actually are using the finger again. The, uh, the basically, um, if you starting to look at more detail that uh, get the get the license deal with the authority, that's one thing. The the cage and the mowing system, that's another thing. Then abrasion will be more on the, uh, you gotta have the crew be able to handle the net, the fish, and also the uh, feeding, that is the big one. And then have better find out the partner of the feed company, if you can find one that, yeah. Uh, and the last one, actually, I would say that for the offshore cage culture, the last component, or maybe to me, is the, the probably the biggest challenge is that where is your buyer? Because market, market is the market. Yeah, the market actually, at, like, 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 the, uh, for example, Malaysia actually have a lot of the potential side, and also few company establish the. Asian sea bass process frozen fillet for the certain market. Yeah. But thinking about thinking about immediately how the people put a new farm and then be able to sell the yeah, put a new farm and have a product to be able to sell to the other one, actually establishing that logistic and the market actually that probably take a longest time and biggest cost. Even for the first even for the first few years, the effort you're gonna put it in there is is probably I would say that probably at least one third of the total the effort you put in one third of that is to be able to lock up your your market. That okay. that's probably the new farmers jumping okay. in for the first few years is the most difficult one that there. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Shonland. Uh, one Mr. question from our one of the member countries, uh, Maldives. They want to know, uh, does any panelist has experience on grouper case culture? I think you have. And uh, uh, group, grouper culture in the lagoons. So if you uh, would like to know, uh, we, uh, can you share uh, uh, your uh, mail ID to him? Or, or can you please discuss on something on that? The grouper okay. uh, grouper oh, culture in the right. yeah, coral group, reef area. Grouper culture. Grouper culture right now have a little bit different from, in the past we have uh, the, uh, if a nameless agara or the uh, manabacas, and that is the size, we are talking about something more like a one kilo, something like that kind of, before that is everything on the land. Uh, in Taiwan, since I'm in Taiwan, this is really a grouper, is really a grouper, the uh, center of the production. Now, more and more cage culture is running the, I, I believe that everybody here, the giant grouper, which the fish actually can grow up to like easily 60 kilogram or even even 100 kilogram that size. The offshore cage culture, a lot of those actually is stocking those kind of the big one. Now he is asking for the uh, more on the uh, shallow water, right? Coastal area. Yeah, that uh, tra uh, traditional, sorry. traditional. Sorry, sorry Mr. Sean, Mr. Sean, uh, it's, uh, he's asking about the grouper in uh, lagoons. Yeah, yeah. and that, that lagoons, actually yeah. my, my, my opinion on that one is that Anels, you have a very, very good hand to handle the fish because all the grouper itself is not a fish like to swim all the time, which means that Every time you have a seasonal change, parasites, only parasites, when you just only deal in the parasites, it's already pent up. It's really <laughs> bad already. So, so yeah, that, that is somebody doing a good job on that is usually if when you are able to handle those, they handle the fish quickly and uh, smoothly on that. Otherwise, that most of the time that I really not, I really not uh, recommend it the, uh, in the raccoon or the uh, near shore cage culture. You, you, you gotta have some skill to deal with those, be able, be able to really make the fish grow enough that. So, so we are talking about something more like one or two kilo, kilo grouper. Of the giant grouper, that's become another story that is big enough that 
and then you can send it to the really big ocean cage to, to run that. So you probably that in the raccoon in the near shore area, that's probably still probably is on the on the uh, like a yeah like like a small type of the grouper is probably better on, on those species. Remember? Uh, thank you, Mr. Shonlen. I I think uh, if you have time, we will come back to you. Uh, and right, just right. I'm uh, right. just uh, uh, moving to the next uh, uh, panelist. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, ask one question. Uh, that is, uh, one of the participants asked question to, I think, Dr. Tiparat can ask this, uh, can answer this question. Uh, cost efficiency of using in, uh, integrated mariculture. Do the integrated mari mariculture farms uh, uh, see higher yield or lower cost? Um. It's about the choice of the species. Yeah. Uh, I think more or less is uh, technically possible to combine the species, especially in IMTA. But again, it's about uh, um, the value that we get from from the products that we grow. So always with the MTA, we put the uh, carnivorous species, that uh, high value species, we combine with other herbivorous and uh, benthic species. I think. Uh, as we see in the example of Indonesia, they try also to develop the cages with two sections. That means to increase the capacity of the cage. That means the production will be increased. So it's up to the level of technology applied, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Viparat. Uh, just uh, uh, another question. I think it is uh, uh, mentioning you. Uh, can we culture oysters, mussels, and seaweed in closed environment? Uh, using the brackish water. Can you repeat again? Back, yeah. Yeah. Brackish. Yeah. One of the participants asking to know, uh, wanting to know, can we culture oysters, mussels, and seaweed in closed environment by using the brackish water? Mm, as far as I leave you, I, I, I haven't seen these uh, such specific cases. Usually, they combine three main group of species in the IMTA or simple techniques like uh, I just mentioned in the PowerPoints. Okay. I think uh, the choice of species again need to be considered and site specific. Okay, okay. thank you very much. And uh, I, I would like to add you one additional question, actually uh, how uh, the coastal communities or the coastal uh, fishermen communities will be uh, uh, sustainable by using the, these uh, integrated mariculture techniques. Uh, what is your suggestion or what do you think uh, on this? Um, uh, for, for people along the coast, as we know, they are uh, more vulnerable. If you ask me in terms of uh, financial benefit, maybe not much, but if we consider also uh, the impact for, of uh, uh, national effort that getting to be more and more, it's better that of our small farmers try to diversify the species uh, and products and make them more resilient in terms of market list and also the production list. I think that would be the, uh, uh, the benefit, I would say is in, intangible benefit that uh, the government and uh, our uh, uh, green corporation uh, may try to help them more because there are so many uh, indirect and intangible benefits uh, that we need to consider as well. Especially during the COVID, we see very obviously nothing about long term, everything short term. And how do we make more people, small people, vulnerable people more resilient? I think integration might be one of the choices. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tiparat. If we if we get time, we will come back to you again. Uh, for running short of time, we, we want to give floor uh, to other panelists also. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, now uh, we have uh, some questions. I, I think not some many questions to Dr. Fusi uh, because uh, speed is a very interesting subject and very uh, most important also uh, in 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 regard of. Uh, 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 culturing the marine fin fishes. So uh, first question is, uh, 
is the higher carbo carbohydrate content uh, in commercial pellet feed is an issue for the promoting healthy gut microbiome or since trust fish generally uh, has less than 1% grapes can can you uh, hear me or i can repeat the question i can hear you the question is about carbohydrate yes uh, is the higher carbohydrate content in commercial pellet an issue for uh, promoting healthy gut microbiome yeah. that is the question of uh, carbohydrate yeah. Well, yeah, um, the carbohydrate coming from the raw material such as like grain. So, you know, the trash fish do not have very high uh, carbohydrate level because they're fish, right? Um, so, um, there's a limit that you cannot uh, for, the, for, the, for the carbohydrate inclusion in the, in, in the diet. Um, for instance, uh, for especially for extruded feed, it, it should not go over 20% of carbohydrate. Otherwise, you have a, a problem with doing the extrusion. Okay. And, uh, uh, yeah, please, please yeah. go on. Please go on. Yeah, yeah. Let, 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 let's um, try to make my point. Yeah, let's the uh, should not have a limit. But for palliative feed, um, there's no uh, such a restriction. However, uh, you know, fish uh, they are actually all diabetic, so they have problem uh, metabolize glucose. So um, the uh, um, um, in terms of the question talking about whether it will actually affect the gut health, yeah, I mean, starch will be utilized by the bacteria in the gut and then may, may uh, become food for, for some of the good bacteria is fine, but bad bacteria may cause gut problems. Yes, uh, you have many questions, so I'll move, from, uh, move to next question. What okay. about the digestible energy level in uh, fin fish diets? Could you please give an idea of the digestible energy? Uh, it really depends, depends on species, yeah? yeah. Species, depends on species depending yeah, on the is species, species, yeah, species specific. specific and it's also warm water cold water specific yeah okay. and uh, for cold water fish like in salmon they typically they formulated the diet to with 35 percent fat so it's very highly energy dense okay thank you uh, mm -hmm. i'm uh, moving to next question to you uh, what about total process loss that is dust in ex extruder is there uh, create any microbial or toxin contamination to finish feed? Uh, total loss due to dust in yeah. in uh, extruded feed. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the standard the industrial standards should be minimized. Uh, I mean, each each feed meal has their own standard. Um, the dust should be minimized as be below like zero point five percent. Um, and and they, they recycle the dust back to the raw material for reprocessing. Yeah. And then the reprocessing, the, the percentage of reprocessing shouldn't be too high because it will affect the pellet quality as well and digestibility because this already been cooked. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you have another question. Uh, DDGS, you know, uh, replacement. Uh, will uh, DDGS uh, a replacement for soybean meal? Uh, it's a question from the participant. I think maybe Sean is better to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mr. Sean, do you want to add something on this question, specific question? Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mr. Sean? Oh, oh. Okay. No, yeah. No. yeah. Hello? One question uh, from our participant that uh, DDGS will be a replacement for soybean meal. Oh, cannot be pretty hard on that. All right, uh, I, 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 I go back to the fundamental. Um, soybean, soybean had the uh, fairly, fairly okay level of the lysine. Corn doesn't have that much, but what the soybean doesn't have is the methionine. So sometimes we will incorporate the, the we, we're still finding the uh, we're still finding the plant protein to compensate the methionine. So so usually when you see 
the uh, when we do the uh, nutrition uh, seminar, you will see. I will sometimes will show the uh, formula. You will see the uh, when this diet is high in soybean, you're gonna find the other the resource to compensate the methylene label. And if that required by the plant protein, actually is by by the corn product. But DDGS, the protein is really high, no, very low. And that part actually is very, very difficult to really, to kind of compensate each other on that one. But if you're thinking about using that to be the main protein ingredients in the diet, that will become very, I mean the low protein diet for some specific, yeah. So thinking about using the DDGs to replace the soybean, I think literally is very difficult because basically you lose a lot of the protein. And, and also when you're losing a lot of the lysine, that actually make the bucket theory, the utilization of the amino acids even further down. So, so that, that's imbalance issue usually is become the things that we kind of the, take in account to consider. Okay. To do the formulation. All okay. Right. Thank, thank you. Uh, just an additional of, uh, addition of this question: that uh, any idea what's the bioavailability, bioavailability, and the amino acid content in DD, DDGS? A bioavailability. Availability. Oh, I, I guess that Dr. Fu, Dr. Guo, Dr. Fuji, you have the answer on that one. <laughs> Um, there's a lot, a lot of data available uh, in the Google search and different DDGS from different regions may have a different digestibility as well and bioavailability. I um, mean DDGS is produced because they are producing bioethanol for the, for the engine, for the car industry, right? So uh, that's the leftover. It's a byproduct actually. So, okay. And, uh, mm -hmm. okay, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Fusi. So uh, if, if you get time, I will get, get back to you again. And uh, now sure. we are moving okay. to uh, Miss Joyce. Uh, can we use the thermal imaging uh, to identify the algal species and water colors? Hmm. So technically, based on the way thermal cameras work, uh, they, they don't work well underwater because water blocks a lot of the infrared wavelengths. So as such, you can see the temperature on the surface, but it would not be significantly useful if you were to look at, if you wanted to look at the temperature depth along a deeper level where fish tend to hang out. So the short answer is no. In the ideal situation, only the surface and nothing below. Yeah, there's a considerable depth that is okay. of interest. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Joyce. Uh, I would like to ask you one uh, additional uh, question. Okay. We know the uh, mariculture in Asia is growing, as uh, mentioned by our uh, key speaker, Mr. Sean Lan also. So uh, do you think uh, uh, what kind of environmental risk may arise in future from this uh, mariculture? Mm, so we have heard about this talk quite a bit today, but I suppose the most common ones that we can expect are possible eutrophication, changes in water quality from accumulation of fish waste, uneaten feed, uh, in pro inappropriate drug use such as antibiotics, hormones in the water, uh, farming fish at high densities with poor risk management protocols would also result in introdu introducing diseases to the local wildlife. And if that species is non-native or is genetically modified in some way, escaped fish may also to a certain extent compete with local species and perhaps alter the ecosystem. Uh, that being said, it's not limited to just mariculture in Asia, but because the, there is such a large variation in the farming methodology okay. in this region, uh, it does place our region at a much higher risk level. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you one last question. That, uh, uh, there is a public perception that uh, uh, what uh, technology increases the uh, production cost. Do you think so, or uh, how Omicron can provide the cost-effective technology in case of uh, IoT or AI? So uh, naturally, any investment in technology, any investment in 
improving your farm quality would certainly result in some form of increased uh, production cost, which can be a legitimate concern for producers. But I believe that if it's implemented correctly, these investments would pay themselves off in the long run. Since farms are no longer investing their finances in unnecessary resources, such as reactive risk management, which is only to settle the problem after it happens, but in proactive risk management, which is implementing these things in advance so that you prevent them in advance. And that's what I hope technology can help them achieve. Yes, uh, obviously, without technology, we cannot, do, we cannot move forward. Uh, thank you, Ms. Joyce. Uh, before, uh, before conclusion, I would like to uh, give uh, floor to our panelists if uh, they uh, want to add uh, some additional uh, things uh, that we, we missed in our discussion. So first I am going to uh, give the floor to Mr. Sean Len, please. Hello. 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 You hear me? Yes, yes, please. Okay. But what? Yeah, you you want to uh, you have you have anything to add in addition with uh, on your uh, speech? Oh, that um. All right. I hope that today what I present and also you hear from everybody's presentation that, well, I know that I usually give the uh, kinds of the desert or something deficient in the presentation to show you the problem. But things is not that bad, all right? So actually there's a new technology. You see what Joyce, that the uh, Joyce that show you a lot of those. Actually now a lot of the AI animation actually does improve and then fight with a lot of the traditional problem. So go forward and then we need investor to come to the region, all right? So that getting better of the aquaculture and we gonna feed the world. And also using soybean, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Sean Len. Uh, now I'm, I'm moving to Dr. Tiparat. Uh, if, uh, if Dr. Tiparat wants to add any additional points on the importance of uh, integration in uh, medical check. Please. We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you, please. Uh, unmute, please. Yeah. Okay. Please. For me, I would like to add uh, the issue of scale. I think for any investment scale is matter. Uh, for individual investors, uh, in the long term, they can make economy of scale uh, on the technological investment uh, and how they use the land and improve more on the technology. But for our small scale farmers, this is a kind of big question, how to make scale for small scale farm, unless they are collaborate and make group of farms and in terms of association, that might be another solution. Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Chiparat. So we, we need more integration in future, Mediculture of Asia. And um, now uh, I, I would like to uh, uh, give floor to Dr. Fusi. Uh, please, uh, if, if you have anything to add in addition with your presentation. Uh, thank you, Sujit. I totally agree with Dr. Tiparat that skill is very important. And uh, pertaining to my company. Um, while in the LG DHA 10 years ago, it was called by a company, it's a, going to be a game changer. But due to the scales, they were not able to produce in hundreds and tens or hundreds thousand tons quantity. So the unit price of LG DHA is still in the $10, $15 level. So uncomparable to fish oil. Um, you know, everybody knows it's a good technology, but it's too expensive to use. So uh, Cobion able to bring, uh, enlarge the commercial scale to the hundreds of thousands of tons of the kind of annual production quantity and able to bring down the uh, production cost. Uh, we're able to improve our production efficiency and bring down the cost. So we are in the same comparable, at least on the fatty acid, uh, bracket that comparable to fish oil. Let's say fish oil is a $1.5, $2 a kilo. We should be in that neighborhood, not, not in $10, $15 a kilo. But um, yeah, 
this one, I think, point to end. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fusip. So uh, I'd like to invite now uh, Ms. Joyce, if you want to add any, any, anything more in addition with your presentation. I totally agree with the other speakers today. I think we've touched on a fair number of topics um, and we sort of realized that there is no one perfect solution available to help this industry, particularly in Asia, to grow. And given the nature of mariculture, it is definitely by far one of the riskier forms of food production that we engage in today. And while it is a goal to strive for, I don't think mariculture will ever be 100% risk-free. But what is important is what we can do to leverage on all of the stakeholders in the industry, whether it's using AI technology, advances in food production, new additives, you know, to bring down that risk factor in whatever way we can and to bring this production in this region forward. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jess, for your valuable comments again. Uh, so, uh, we, with all these presentations, actually, we, uh, uh, we come to end uh, uh, to this webinar. And uh, before uh, uh, conclusion, I would like to invite uh, uh, Ms. Charlene Marie Antone Swami, Director in Fish, uh, to say a few words. Ms. Uh, Charlene Marie Antone Swami. Thank you, Sujit. Uh, and thank you to each and every uh, one of the panelists uh, for the very, very insightful uh, presentations and information that we received. I am very confident that uh, all, the, all the audience uh, participants have benefited significantly from the information, just as how um, InfoFish has also gained uh, a lot of uh, insightful uh, information from the presentations. Uh, indeed, it's, it's been um, quite uh, interesting to see the developments taking place in mariculture and some of the issues that, uh, how, how we go about addressing these uh, issues as well. So uh, again, uh, thank you very much also to each and every participant who has joined us today. We had close to 200 uh, participants today uh, for this event. Uh, do look out for our other um, similar webinars coming up uh, in the next uh, two weeks or so. We have our tuna, the third tuna webinar, and then we have uh, another one on functional feeds coming up as well. Uh, We'll keep you informed on the uh, events that is being organized. A very, very big thank you to our exclusive sponsor, Spreading a Nutrigo company for uh, supporting this uh, informational um, webinar. Uh, please, um, we look forward to seeing you again in our future events. Thank you. Yeah, okay, so with all these presentations and question and answer, comments uh, and we try to address the future mariculture development in Asia. Uh, we do believe that our invited panelists were conscious enough uh, in focusing the integration, application of species uh, specific related feed and application of innovative technology. And uh, we are looking forward to see a resilient uh, coastal livelihood and sustainable mariculture development in Asia. We do hope that uh, it was an useful webinar and all the participants, stakeholders will be benefited from this. I'd like to thank uh, each and everyone who joined from different time zones and participated uh, till the end of the session. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Spreading Group for sponsoring this uh, exciting mariculture uh, webinar. And please feel free to write to us for any technical updates related to the uh, fisheries, aquaculture and seafood sector. And uh, will be uh, will also uh, be appreciated to attend in our uh, next uh, webinars, you know, forthcoming webinars. And we have uh, a couple of webinars in the in September. We have a high level and regional virtual virtual dialogue focusing GCC region, and we have uh, certification and tuna uh, certification and technology for tuna, and uh, we have functional aquafeed sustainable solution for the. Uh, feed industry. So uh, please mark the dates in your calendar and keep following us through www.infofish.org for the updates. Till then, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Si vous voulez que. Dude. Yes. How are you? Hello, Mark. Bro, is a good one. Oh, go. Good, good. Very How good. You? Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Mark, are you there? Yeah. Mark, oh. hi, Mark. Yeah, sorry, Mark. Yeah. Had to move. Okay, just, well, just to let you know that uh, we had uh, about 520 participants who registered for the webinar. Yeah. Uh, but of course, those who attended, we had close to 200. So, we will, yeah, we will be sharing with you the complete list, of course, uh, as part of the, being the sponsor of the event. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ms. Van, yeah. for facilitating and yeah. for sponsoring this event. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank, you. Nice. thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye.